All right, Steve. Well, we're back with another podcast. How you been? Oh, excellent. You know, Jeff, there's something going on in my personal life I've got to share. Uh, have I told you, Jeff? I think that I have. I'm getting a range put into my uh, my backyard. Yes, everyone who knows that is very jealous. So, you know, we've got a very special guest today. He was gracious enough to join us on the podcast. We have the president of the USPSA and the Steel Challenge Shooting Organization, Mike Foley. Mike, how are you today? You know, I'm just living the dream, and I'm if you ask me to, to join their podcast, it's going to be a lot of fun hanging out with you guys. Well, great. Well, let's get right to this interview. You know, one of the things that Steve and I do, we provide like a tip or a trick to our sh- members. We're hoping that maybe this week you could provide one. Sure. A- absolutely. Uh, so everybody has a shot timer. Uh, everybody trains with a shot timer, hopefully. And and certainly when you go to uh, your, your next match, you're going to have the shot timer uh, in your ear. Uh, five times for every stage, and if you're shooting all eight stages, you're going to have, uh, you know, the, the, the chance to react 39 times to that uh, shot timer. This tip is good for a tremendous amount of improvement on your initial time, and it should translate to every stage for every minute. That's this. I try to think of the audible tone of the timer as the word beep. If you think about your time, it sounds something like, Beep, beep. So if I if I think about that audible tone as the word beep, I want to react to the B in beep, not the beep itself. And the, the best way to, to, to become one with that is just sit quietly at your house and, and, and hit your shot timer and listen to it. And after about seven or eight times of listening to it, that beep sounds like it's three seconds long. And it's not three seconds long. But I promise if, 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 if you start listening for the B and beep and reacting on the B, oftentimes you will have the first task completed, whether it's a draw or whether it's a low ready start, uh, you will have the first task completed before the beep is finished. And that should be good for about a quarter second of run. So if you're trying to make GM like uh, Zach Jones is in PCC, uh, then if you listen to that, that should give you enough of a difference to make it. Mike, that's a great tip. You know, considering out of the 39 strings that we shoot in a match, 31 of them count for time. Any small improvement you can make, and especially on that first shot draw, which is going to happen on every string, that's going to make a big difference. So that's a great tip. Thank you. Welcome. All right. So, you know, we uh, came up with a bunch of questions here. We're going to run through them and see uh, if how the answers go. Right off the bat, what did you do before you became the USA president? You haven't always been the USPSA president, so... uh, What was your job beforehand? Immediately before becoming USPSA president, director of sales and operations uh, at Shooters Connection. Uh, Many of your listeners will know Shooters Connection. They're an online retailer of competition shooting equipment. Uh, I was there for almost nine years in in that role. At the same time, I also did some teaching, uh, some trading, and some consulting to the firearms industry. Uh, At some point, I had eight ways to make a living, and they all involved in one way or another, me or someone else pulling the trigger. Well, that's great. So far, the interviews helped me because I didn't know that. So thanks for sharing that. Why did you want to become the USPSA president? Well, I love USPSA and Steel Challenge, and, and I want them to always be here. In recent years, it was apparent that USPSA had some serious issues and was not running the business aspects of the organization at what I consider to be a sustainable level. They simply weren't being everything they could be, and there there was plenty of room for improvement. Uh, The organization needed professional business leadership and and full-time and in a hurry. Someone had to break the trend of hiring professional shooters as part-time leaders Uh, and get USPSA's business back on track for the future. That someone had to also be able to win the election. In 2014, when I made the decision to run in 2015 for this position uh, starting in 2016, I looked at the candidates who were running, and and some of them were friends. Uh, Some of them were people that I didn't know that seemed quite capable. But what I didn't see is he was A, capable, and B, had a snowball's chance in hell of winning the election. And I felt like that I could bridge that gap and, and get that done. Really what drove me to, to, to want this position. Excellent. Well, let's dig into a little bit about Mike Foley, the shooter. So I did a little research, and I see that you're a GM and PCC in the USPSA. You're also a master in four other divisions. Outright master, not a master because you're a GM. But out of all the guns that you shoot, 
What's your favorite gun? That's a, a, a really difficult question for me to answer because I love to shoot anything with a trigger on it. Every US PSA and Steel Challenge has something about it that I enjoy. Uh, it, it's really hard for me to name a favorite, but I do tend to like uh, Wilson Combat 1911s, 2011s, and AR9s in US PSA. While in Steel Challenge, I tend to prefer uh, rim fire to center fire. Uh, the rim impact, I think it's a really great place to compete today with all the talented athletes that we have. The fastest measure of anything in all practical shooting is, you know, rim fire or uh, rim fire rifle open. Th those are those are what I consider to be the most pure race in the shooting sports, and, and because of that, you know, I like rim fire for Steel Challenge. Excellent. You were instrumental in bringing PCC and carry optics into the USPSA, and first as provisional divisions, and now I believe they're full-blown divisions. Why did you see this needed to be added to our sport? Carry optics was already on the table when I got here, but it wasn't doing well. We tried to bring some life into it on multiple occasions, and this year it's finally hit its stride. Uh, PCC, on the other hand, was a no-brainer to me. It is as fun and fast as open division, but with a much simpler barrier to entry as it uses firearms, optics, and available and popular in the mainstream. I almost akin it to open and production having a baby because everything's pretty much readily available, yet it's top fuel as far as speed goes. Uh, I had shot it at the Southeast Pro-Am in 2015 at South River Gun Club in Covington, Georgia. And on the ride home with my friend and fellow competitor Jason Edwards, discussed how much fun it was and how much fun it would be to run USPSA stages with it. A few days later, I won the election and found myself in a position to be able to present it to the USPSA Board of Directors, and I did just that. In its first full year, it was the fourth largest division and is poised to be the third largest USPSA division very soon. Well, that's great. I personally shoot PCC in USPSA. I'm having a blast with it, and I'm the answer I give to everybody is the exact same answer you just gave. It's just fun. Hey, Mike, I'm not sure if I've shared this fun fact with you or not, but we met for the first time in 2016 at the World Speed Shoot out in uh, San Luis Obispo out in California, and you are the reason why I shoot PCC to this day. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> so so are you blaming me or thanking me? I, I think I'm thanking you. So how... <laughs> So how it went was, uh, you know, I've known Zach Jones for the last couple of years because my parents live in right outside of Charleston. And uh, I'll tell you that story another time. But I went over to Zach's match and um, shot his match and we became became friends. And so we're out in California and I talked to Zach and I saw somebody shooting a PCC. And I think it was, you know, it was Carol. Carol was shooting a PCC. And I, and I said to Zach, I said, man, have you shot PCC before? He said, oh, yeah, I love it. I said, you have one? He says, no. And uh, he said, uh, Mike Foley's got a PCC. And I said, wow, you think he'd let me shoot it? He said, yeah, let me, uh, let me go talk to him. And so uh, you were over there doing an interview with Shooting USA. Zach came back with this uh, PCC. And I said, wow, this is pretty cool. And, you know, I shot the gun and I just, oh, I just absolutely fell in love and then i told zach i said is this mike's pcc he's like yeah i said boy i want to you know thank him for uh letting me borrow it and trying it out and he said well steve about that y you know uh i really didn't ask him so uh, i probably <laughs> need to put it back <laughs> <laughs> That's how my addiction to PCC started. So thank you, Mike. <laughs> First bump's always free. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's switch gears a little bit, a little bit away from USPSA, but still staying in what I call the paper game. This year, Ipsic Nationals, down here in Frostproof, Florida, they had production optics. So is this now official division of Ipsic? Production optics is a provisional division in, in Ipsic for now. Uh, but there's a rules committee at work to draw on the regional rules of IPSC regions testing it to develop a rule set to present at an IPSC General Assembly. Uh, our own uh, director of the National Range Officer Institute, Troy McManus, is on that committee. Uh, and the next IPSC World Shoot is in 2020 and will be held in Pattaya, Thailand. However, we have an IPSC General Assembly coming up in two months uh, in Thailand. 
and I suspect that we'll be talking about production optics at this. Uh, I haven't seen the final presentation from the committee, uh, but I do know that our friends from around the world have been uh, keenly interested in both PCC and carry optics. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, be too surprised if we don't infect the rest of the world with our illnesses. So both are being considered for future world shoot competitions. They are. That's fantastic. Speaking of IPSC, being on social media, they just had the IPSC Pan American Handgun Championships, and you won the Classic Division. Congratulations. Thank you. What was that like, shooting out of the country, shooting IPSC, which most Americans don't shoot that much? We Our matches are USPSA. Rules are slightly different. What was it like being in Jamaica and shooting that match? It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed the challenge. Our host in Jamaica put on a great match. Uh, we had uh, shot the IPSC National Championship here in the U.S. in Frostburg the week before. Uh, I didn't shoot extremely well there. Uh, but IPSC is a very technical and very difficult game, and it brings out uh, some more difficult shots and uh, Sometimes uh, just the whole 3-2-1 uh, format uh, tends to be uh, more about the shooting uh, than, it, than it is about anything else. And, and so uh, with that and the, the lovely backdrop of, uh, of Jamaica uh, and uh, coming away with a win in the division and, and the shoot-off, uh, you know, I, I got nothing but smiles on my face from that experience. Uh, it's certainly different, though, than what we're accustomed to here in the U.S. Well, you know, I saw the video of your shoot-off, and that was, I mean, you squeaked by that one run. I'm not sure if it was the final run or not, but the reload and the two shots, you got them just off before the guy hit the final plate or the final popper. Do you see something like that coming back to the USPSA in the major matches where there might be some shoot-offs or even some side matches that uh, add just a little different flair? You know, shoot-offs are, are a lot of fun. and we used to do them, you know, at all of our national championships. The last time I saw one was around 2004 at, at Passa Park in, in Barrie, Illinois. The thing about shoot-offs in today's world is that the way that we structure matches, not every competitor or every top competitor are there at the end of the match. I'm shooting the Area 5 championship this weekend. And I'm shooting on Friday because I got into the match late. Top shooters like Shane Coley, who's on my squad there, and for us to be able to shoot, say, in a shoot-off at the end of that match, we'd have to be there on Sunday afternoon. And I, I would be willing to bet some of the people who shoot Thursday or Friday or even Saturday are not going to be around Sunday for the shoot-off. So there's a bit of scheduling there that is contingent upon the format. If you take the uh, USPSA Nationals this year, where we have the nine days of Nationals format, uh, we're literally cramming three-day championships and awards into uh, each segment. Uh, but in, in a back-to-back -back, uh, situation where all of the competitors end on the same day, uh, that, that could possibly work. The culture of IPSC is such that they always have uh, a week-long match experience. You shoot for four or five days, then you rest a day, and you come back for the shoot-off and the awards. Because of that culture, they tend to attract people who are there for a week-long experience, not just a weekend experience or a, a, a partial week experience. And in the, U, in the U.S., the, the, the fact that we're, trying, that we're having more and more demand for competitors to shoot national championships, you know, we have, um, in the nine days of nationals, we have 1,300 slots, and we're over, um, overbooked. There are... 125 or 30 people that are on the wait list to get into those matches. Wow. Um, so uh, we, we literally are, are, are getting to the limits of supply and demand uh, for, for national championship slots. And because of that, and it's a new problem for us, the format makes a difference. And, and so uh, would I rule it out? No, I think shootoffs are great. I think they're great fun. Uh, I, I think it would certainly add something to, to matches. Is it something that I think should be absolutely manned for every match? No, I think it really is up to, um, you know, the, the, the person who, who's putting that match on the ground and, and, and what they want to do with, with their particular championship at whatever level. If you do a shoot-off, even with the, the week-long commitment for IPSC uh, Pan American, 
not all of the top competitors stayed. I think that they had to go maybe 12 or 13 places deep in some of the division competitors for the shoot-off. So even in that environment, it, 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 it's it's not something that's just a given that people want to do it. And so um, I don't know that that's, that that's the right answer. That's, that's just all of the information that we have about it today. And uh, if we do it, uh, I want it to make sense, and I want it to flow, and I want it to work, and I want it to be meaningful. Well, I think that's a really good point, and a lot of it has to do, again, as you pointed out, with the cultural differences between IPSC and USPSA, more of a week-long experience. I mean, many times, even at some of the state-level matches, people are rolling in, shooting it in one day, and leaving. And there might be two or three other days where people are shooting. And so, not like you point out, not everybody's there at the end of the match. Shoot and scoot thing is a reality, and it would have to be addressed. Absolutely. Sure. So, enough on USPSA and IPSC. Let's move to Steel Challenge. Now, something happened this year. And you and Jason Edwards did it, and that was the shooting all 13 divisions in the match. What was that like? It was a lot of fun. It was also a lot of work. Um, while I had all the equipment for most of the divisions, I put together a couple of the firearms just a week ahead of the match, specifically the optic sight revolver. I, I have to say that even though Jason and, Jason and I were the first two to accomplish this, uh, that I was first because I finished the match 24 hours before. <laughs> Case if you're keeping the score, Jason. <laughs> so and Jason always says, if you're not first, you're last. So uh, <laughs> just, just want to get that out there that I was first. Now, he may have even beat me in score. In fact, he can tell you how many seconds he beat me across all 13 divisions and, and likely will. But uh, it was a lot of fun, and, and we really enjoyed doing it together. And it, it, was, it was certainly interesting to shoot four guns the first day three the second, four the third, and two the fourth. Um, it really was. Is it something you'd do again? I'm not sure I would. It, it, it was nice to be the first to do it, um, but I felt I could have been a little more competitive if I'd focused on five or six divisions uh, that I shoot regularly instead of using my free time shaking out 13 guns, ammo, backup guns, support equipment, range bags, <laughs> how to lock it all down, how to drive from here to Alabama with it, uh, how to make sure that I had 2,600 rounds of ammo in case, you know, uh, in case I took extra shots, bring a few more rounds. And, and it was uh, it was a big undertaking. Uh, I'm not going to rule it out, but but it's very likely that next year I'll focus on five or six guns that are more important to me. Excellent. Well, the Steel Challenge has seen, I would say, unprecedented growth in the last two years. From your perspective as the president, why do you think that is? Well, it's simple, really. Uh, we started treating it like a full-fledged shooting sport instead of a collection of events. It was time to stop treating it like a bad purchase. Uh, one of the key steps there was revamping the classification system. Uh, another was loosening the requirements on local clubs and matches, and a third was definitely recruiting Zach Jones as the, the director. Those were all pivotal decisions. Uh, Jake Martins, who's the director of media and events for USPSA and Steel Challenge, understands this model, and he's utilized our media and our marketing vehicles to a, a great extent to promote Steel Challenge. He understands the importance of Steel Challenge to the members and to the organization. That's fantastic. I know, I think uh, at the CMP and Talladega this year, we had over 650 guns, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. That's amazing. And and hopefully it will continue to be uh, see the same growth as it's seen in past years. Now, bringing up the CMP, great range. The match was sponsored by Sig Sauer. Um, is that relationship going to continue in years to come? We will be back you know, the 15th through the 19th of May. 2019. That'll be um, a month earlier than we were there this time. Hopefully, uh, we'll get a little bit more favorable weather to those who can't uh, seem to hack the heat and humidity, the summer heat, if you will. Uh, right now, the contract is only extended through 2019, but our success in Alabama, with over twice the guns entered into the match than previous years, tells me the location works for those who are interested in Steel Challenge competition, and we couldn't have asked for better hosts. Uh, as far as SIG, we are working very closely with them on a commitment to continue to be the title sponsor for that event, uh, and we should have some news on that very soon. Well, that's awesome. Um, I want to point out to everyone who's listening to this, who at next year's match may be uh, competing in the senior division, 
Um, my birthday is on the last day of the match, and I don't qualify to be a senior, so you're all safe for one more year. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, on our last interview, Zach Jones alluded to uh, the changes or some changes that are coming with peak times. Uh, could you add any more color to that for our listeners? Absolutely. Every year after the World Speed Shooting Championship, we review the peak stage times to ensure that the classification system is migrating as the game gets faster. If shooting sports classification systems don't evolve, they'll forever be based on a point in time which is essentially just the first baseline. Uh, so, Jeff, uh, thanks for your help in that process. You, Zach, and I reviewed a lot of data, and we'll soon be releasing a statement about what will change and when, but I intend to give a little notice. Um, so I'd expect the change to be planned for around the 1st of January. Uh, if I recall, about nine divisions will get slight changes to some stages and overall times, and they will get a little faster. Uh, it's not dramatic, and when we make a statement here in the in the coming weeks, uh, we will actually uh, detail what the changes will be and when they'll take effect. That way, if someone's working on a classification, they have the incentive to go ahead and get that done and and um, work harder on it and, and get to more matches here in the fall uh, and also uh, be able to start planning their training and, and, and so forth. But it's all based on records that were set at the World Speed Shooting Championship with a keen eye toward what people are shooting in matches at all levels. And none of it is unattainable. So, you know, to, to move up to Grand Master even, you don't have to be faster than the person who set the world record. You just have to be within 5% of them. And there are so many people that are, that are reaching um, new heights with uh, regards to especially to the rimfire divisions and the PCC divisions uh, that it was time for some adjustments. That's a great point, Mike. Ron Oliver and I had a discussion at the 2017 U.S. Steel Shoot. Some people call it the Nationals in uh, Conyers or Covington, Georgia. And we were talking about now we're the old guys, and it, there used to be a very exclusive club in the rimfire and now in the PCC world uh, that you shot below 70 seconds, and now the leaderboard just in 12 short months is littered with people that are shooting sub-70s. I saw Ethan shoot a 64. I think Colin Campbell, uh, he shot a 62 last year, but that was up at Area 5. Uh, Casey Sebio shot a 60-point something with his rimfire pistol open. Wow, do you think we're going to be in the 50s here before long? I, I said at the awards at, at, at the WSSC in uh, June that I think we'll see a 59 next year. And I, I, I would tend to think that as, as, as many young and talented shooters as we have, like Cole Bush, for example, or uh, Ethan Anacondo as, as an example, that, that, that we will see someone break 60. You know, it was just um, two years ago that we saw B.J. Norris break 80 with an iron sight gun, and he was the first person to do that, you know, from, from the holster. He shot a 79-second limited run. And so I, I think we'll see the same thing happen here. And I would suspect that 59 is within reach because there are so many 62s and 63s and 64s being shot. Mike, along those lines, I want to talk about some of our junior shooters. What what sort of strategies does USPSA, whether it's through USPSA or Steel Challenge, how do we continue to bring some of these youth shooters into the mix and get them get them excited and encouraged about shooting matches. Cause I think you were just down, down Jamaica with uh, Justine and Jalice and they're, they're two amazing shooters. How do we keep fueling that type of excitement and energy? Well, steel challenges is, is very good at bringing in families and juniors and ladies and people from, from categories uh, because it's, it's, it's a lower barrier to entry. Uh, it's uh, a very uh, simple game to learn, uh, and you race against yourself until you get to the absolute top tier. So because of that, I think Steel Challenge is a really good model for all other shooting sports and the amount of junior participation that it has. Uh, in USPSA, we tend to get junior competitors uh, after the age of 12 or 13, 
and we tend to have them until they reach the age of seven, at which time they go to college or they go to military service or they go to a trade school or they, be, they, they begin a career. And at that point, we generally lose them again until they are a 20-something year old with free taxable income. And that gap is always going to exist because of the fact that, that, that their focus, and as it should be, is on creating a, a life for themselves. If you don't have, um, you know, the proper education or training or setup for life, it's going to be very hard to afford to play the shooting games as an adult. And, and so I think that that's, that's, that's an important gap that's there for a reason. Uh, so be, because of, of, of that, um, you know, we want to make sure that all junior shooters feel welcome always. And I have uh, certainly seen a, a lot of interest in some of the area camps that are going on and, and some of the other experiences. Um, the more juniors we have, uh, the more there will be uh, the, the, st the proper statistics for the rulebook appendix to give out awards and so forth for those things. But whether it's juniors or adults, the excitement of the game has to be the allure. You cannot you cannot give enough incentives to get people to play the game if they don't want to play the game. And so what we want to do is get them here, give them a great experience, let them have fun, and those who enjoy it will keep coming back. And so it, it, it's really um, um, it's it, it, there's really no secret in that. Uh, if someone had a magic pill that would tomorrow dump uh, a whole lot more junior shooters into the shooting sports. Uh, I would certainly embrace it, but uh, as, as far as I can tell, it's it's just us being uh, friendly and welcoming and, and, and warm to them and being in, in, in places where they dwell. And one of the things that um, that I'm seeing our community do better is not Facebook, because that's, a, that's an old person's social media now, but um, in Instagram uh, and, 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 and some of those things, posting videos and putting those tags out there. And I think at some point there will be places that we can go where kids are, are playing video games or whatever and perhaps uh, perhaps tap into that interest. Uh, sure. We've worked with two or three guys who are developing practical shooting games uh, on the Steam platform uh, for uh, USPSA and Steel Challenge, and I think that that's also an exciting opportunity uh, to get juniors in at some point. You know, Jeff and I were talking a couple of weeks ago about Cole Bush and Ethan and Chase, and it's been interesting just to watch some of these young men grow up in the sport and Cole Bush has really turned it on in the last 12 months. And, you know, I, I kid around with Jeff and I said, you know, I just can't wait until they're old enough to drive. So they get a nice truck and maybe they get a girlfriend and Maybe they lose a little bit of interest in shooting for just a little bit until they come back from college. Give me a give me a couple more year window. Yeah, the problem with that is then you've got the brags coming behind, and then who else? You know, you can you can go to these matches, and and for me, I started in USPSA, and Mike, your point about Steel Challenge being more familial uh, is absolutely the truth. I went to the. 2017 nationals was my first big match and i was blown away by the parents and the kids and everybody's smiling and and it's not to say that usp isn't the same way but it's a different vibe you go to smoke and hope you know what smoke and hope is you know how you're going to shoot smoke and hope and you go shoot smoke and hope. uspsa you got five minutes to figure out what you're going to do on that stage and so it's a little more intense and uh, there's not as much uh joking around I should say. I, I would agree with that. It, it is certainly a little more intense. Uh, it tends to uh, attract, a, you know, a, a person who is, is, is more geared toward that. But, you know, in that same regard, there's nothing as intense as stepping up behind one of those guys who's shooting up in six seconds and, you know, laying down a seven something and feeling now all of a sudden like you're the old slow fat guy. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Same here. I don't know. What do you mean, Steve? I don't get it. <laughs> well, Mike, this has been great. Do you have any parting final thoughts you'd like to share with our listeners? Yes. I'd like to thank everyone in USPSA and Steel Challenge Shooting Association who are engaged, playing the game, engaging the leadership, and especially those working to put on matches for all of us to shoot. The friendship, fellowship, and fun are contagious indeed. And I just really appreciate the way that everyone's plugging in and helping us make this a success. Excellent. Mike, that went great. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time, Mike. Yeah. Really appreciate it.
Happy to do it, fellas. So, Steve, have you found any new products out there on the market lately you'd like to share with our listeners? Great question, Jeff. Rainstore.net offers so much more than steel target paint. I think I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago that me and my wife made the move to sell our home, to buy another home so I can have enough property to put in a practice range. And the home that we purchased here, I don't know, it's been about six weeks or so ago, it wasn't lived in for a couple months, and you know what happens when that, oh when, uh, yeah, when it's vacant for a little bit, the wasp and ants, they kind of, yeah, they want to move in, right? So I've got some wasp and ant killer from rainstore.net, and it works absolutely fantastic. So go out to rainstore.net and pick you up some wasp and ant killer. Excellent, Steve. Thanks. All right, Jeff, there's a lot of matches coming up. What are some of the favorites you have out on the schedule? Well, the ones that I found that I think might interest people, uh, again, on August 25th, we've got the Bonnie and Clyde match in Texarkana, Texas. Um, September 1st, we have the Kentucky State match. And then we've mentioned it before, but again, on September 8th, we have the Area 6 match in Volusia County. And I know you're coming down to that, and I'm going to be shooting that, and there's going to be a lot of good shooters down there. So if you want to test yourself, come on down to the Area 6 championships in Volusia. What have you found uh, on the schedule, Steve? Well, we've got the East Coast Steel Challenge Championship. That's on September 22nd. The same weekend as the Free State Championships, which is in Kansas. And then we have the North Carolina State Steel Challenge match, and that's the first of its kind. September 29th, we've got the Rimfire World, and that's October 6th. Again, check out rimfirechallenge.org for a current match calendar, and then go to steelchallenge.com for the event calendar to find a match near you. Steve? Another great episode. I tell you, uh, the numbers don't lie. We're getting a lot of listeners, and uh, we seem to be doing something right. So I think we should keep doing what we're doing. Sounds great, Jeff. And if anybody has any ideas or topics, we've got some high-profile guests coming on here in the next couple of weeks, some people that you'll be excited to hear from outside of you and I, Jeff. So if you have any ideas, please post to the Facebook page or send us an email. And we'll see you out on the range soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Don't forget, one shot, one steal.